Hi, everyone. I'm Dave Philippi, the Director of Film and Video at the Wexner Center for the Arts. And I'd like to welcome everyone to this special conversation um, around the, uh, the release of the new documentary, Aggie, um, about the great um, philanthropist and collector Agnes Gunn. And obviously, we're having a little bit of a, there we go. We're still waiting for Catherine, um, but we thought instead of having everyone um, continue to wait, we'll, we'll get the panel going and, and they'll join us as, as soon as they can. Um, but um, thank you once again for joining us. I hope you all had a chance to watch the terrific um, film that's been available. Uh, thanks to Marcus Hu and Strand releasing over the weekend and um, sit back and enjoy the conversation. We'll save some time at the end for question and answer. And now I would like to turn things over to the director of the Wexner Center, Johanna Burton. Hello, everybody. So sorry for the delay on our end. We had a, we had a sort of issue moving from one room to another virtually, but here we are and this is um, where we wanna be. So as Dave mentioned, um, we're gonna leave a little bit of time for Q&A that will happen um, through the chat. So don't feel um, you need to wait to ask questions. We'll get to those as soon as we can. Before I introduce our panel tonight, I wanna thank the WEX donors, members and board members who have joined us tonight. Though we can't be together in person, I'm thrilled that we can join virtually, coming together from points all over the map to share this moment. And more than that, it's your investment that keeps the WEX moving forward in our mission to provide support for the art and artists of our time. I'm honored to be leading this conversation and discussing Aggie, the absolutely breathtaking documentary from director Catherine Gund, who has joined us tonight. Aggie is not just a lovely showcase of Ag Aggie's extraordinary life, but the film raises crucial questions of art, justice, inclusion, diversity, and access. Glenn Ligon um, really wonderfully joins us tonight. He's a remarkable artist. He's featured in the film and a fam familiar face to Wex fans. Um, Glenn's exhibition, Some Changes, was in our galleries in 2007. Um, we're thrilled to have you with us, Glenn. And also uh, we have with us, we're lucky to have with us the film's co-producer, Tanya Silveratnam, who has engaged with many um, projects around these topics um, and is an old friend. So I'm delighted also to have her here. Uh, there is Catherine just in time. So here we all are. And thank you to everybody. I'm just going to kick this right off with um, a question for Glenn, actually. Um, so each of these conversations, and you've been doing a number of them, Catherine and Tony, you can talk about this a bit later, have had really different constitutions. And depending on who's um, in each of the virtual rooms, you end up focusing on different things. I wanted to really use the opportunity to talk to Glenn, who I found to be absolutely riveting in the film and to ask some of the, the questions that I, I stood um, alongside the longest. So Glenn, you incisively comment in the film on the discrepancy between institutions saying that they're committed to showing artists of color and acquisition dates that would say otherwise. How are museums changing infrastructurally? Acquisition, staffing, support are just part of that equation. And are we truly seeing a historic change in reflexive thinking around the role of museums and culture? I, I just want to hear you talk more about that. I, I thought it was really interesting. Well, um, thank you. First, thank you for inviting me to the conversation. Um, glad to have been part of the film and glad to be in the discussion around it at the Wexner. Uh, you know, in a way, it's kind of a joke when I said that, you know, when you go to museums, you know, I, I when I go to the museums, I look at the acquisition days, but in a way, it's quite true, because I feel like often when I'm at museums and looking at the work of artists of color, I notice that either the work was acquired very recently, or it was acquired a long, long time ago, and I've never seen it. Uh -huh. So there's this strange sort of thing of like, you know, the, just that, uh, museum today and I saw an amazing painting by an artist named Benny Andrews, African-American painter, acquired at the time, uh, 75, 76, hadn't been shown until about three years ago, you know. So I think there is this kind of, um, you know, museums have huge collections, they can't show everything, but I feel like there's a kind of uh, gap in terms of like the acquisition of artists of color versus when they're actually on the walls. And I think museums are trying to correct that now, um, but it's kind of too late, you know, <laughs> which isn't to say that they shouldn't show the work they have and they shouldn't be acquiring work, but um, 
for someone of my generation growing up, it would have been super important for me to have seen that Benny Andrews painting, to have seen that Alma Thomas painting, to have seen that Faith Ringgold at the time when I was a young artist as role models for the possibility of just even being an artist. And now I'm grateful to see that work, you know, more and more in the museum spaces, but I also find it slightly problematic uh, that museums of recent, you know, recently have been deacquisitioning work to buy artists of color, which again, not a bad thing, <laughs> buying artists of color, but wondering why museum trustees aren't putting up the money that they put up to buy the Rothko, to buy the Bryce Martin, to buy the Richard Serra, uh, why that isn't, money isn't being sort of generated to buy the Adrian Piper, David Hammonds, you know, why they have to sell a Rothko, you know, to buy a Negro, you know? I mean, that's, that's a big issue for me. So th that's kind of what I'm thinking about when I think about museum acquisitions. Excellent. Thank you. And, and just a follow up question, because you also pointed in that um, sort of passage in the film to the importance of changing curatorial staff, changing um, staffing in general. Um, can you say, or anyone, uh, Catherine or Tanya too, I think that's another piece of this of this conversation. And, and you seemed um, hopeful on that front and that changes are happening that that feel like they are making um, progress. And, and I think certainly that's a conversation we should all be having um, in terms of, of that structure. Right. Well, I think that there are amazing people of color who are entering the curatorial world, yeah. uh, many of which I've worked with, um, and many more coming along the pipeline. So I think I'm hopeful in that sense is that the talent is out there because before the argument was there's no talent out there, you know? And I remember being in a, in a discussion uh, about this very issue. And as we were talking, I just started making a list you know, of like names of curators and I just like curators of color. And as I was making my list, I said, hmm, what do all these people have in common? Oh, they've all worked at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Right. You know, right. so, so in a way it's about Thelma Golden and the Studio Museum being a training ground yeah. for Naomi Beckwith, you know, uh, our, you know, curators like that who've gone on to other museums, uh, Thomas Lax, uh, Akili and Susan Boston, you know, like right. thinking through like, how do we make pipelines for people to enter the field? Because I feel like a lot of institutions don't want to grow things they just want to harvest things, you know? So Thomas Lax wasn't Thomas Lax mm -hmm. until yeah. he was trained to be, Tom, you know, like trained to be the amazing curator at MoMA that he is, but he didn't come out of nowhere. He had to have this kind of training, you know? And so I think that's super important in terms of bringing people into the field. You know, they have to grow up somewhere. And I yeah. think a lot of times the big institutions don't want to mentor. They just want to take people fully formed. Absolutely. No, it's it's a really, it's an, a very interesting point. Um, I wondered actually, Glenn, just to put you on the spot for one more minute, but to ask Tanya and Catherine a little bit about this, your work, um, the, the works that show up in the film are really um, these very beautiful pieces and pieces that I love very much. Can we talk a little bit? I love something, and Catherine, maybe you can talk about this. You chose to use the artworks in this abundant, gorgeous way without a lot of commentary about each of them. So will you just talk about Glenn's work um, in, the, in the film and how then overall the strategy to utilize the works in the way that you did um, came about? Because I, I found it to be extremely lush, but also not, it, wasn't, it didn't over-determine any of the work itself. That's a wonderful question because it's really coming from someone who understands the artwork and what the references can be and what the emotions yeah. can be. And, I think it was really important to me to use the art uh, as itself, as a as a as an a puncturing, as a as an aerating a way into this other world, not illustration of what we were saying, um, but more about sort of a a feeling, a reference, an echo, a resonance, and so. You know, I think about Glenn's pieces are so ideal in the film because they occupy that space between what Aggie might articulate and where we're going. And it goes back to that 
quote that you um, referenced about of, of Ava's quote at the beginning, which bookends the film at the beginning and the end, which is how, what do artists and, and activists, what is art and how do art and justice relate to each other? Mm -hmm. And she said, they're both the same thing. They're about looking into the future, into an empty space and seeing something that could be that doesn't already exist and believing that it could be and then making it so. And so I think, you know, I hope that Glenn will speak about a couple of his pieces, but one of his pieces that is very deep for me in the film and embedded is the with hope piece. And, and that one I know was actually how Brian Stevenson, one of the most important leaders and guides of our day, um, signed his book, um, signed, signed something to Glenn that said with hope, Brian. And it's actually that with hope is Brian's signature that's his sign off. Um, but it's also why I think that film about Aggie is so important and magical right now and so differently meaningful than it might have been a year ago or certainly four years ago um, and maybe in the future. But right now, what we need is this sense of, of belonging. And, and what that is doing is giving us this notion that there is a future that's worth believing in. Um well, one of the things that's interesting about that uh, work uh, with Hope was that I was at a book signing uh, sponsored by Darren Walker, the Ford Foundation, uh, to celebrate Brian Stevenson's memoir, uh, Just Mercy. And um, Brian signed the book for me, as you said. And he said, you know, to Glenn, with hope, Brian Stevenson. And I looked at that with hope and I thought, oh, I can make a neon in his handwriting <laughs> as a benefit addition for Equal Justice Initiative. And all of that came from thinking about Aggie's philanthropy, mm -hmm. Aggie selling a Lichtenstein painting to uh, go to organizations and individuals who are fighting for justice. And I thought, I can do some small version of that, make this neon that all the proceeds will go to Equal Justice Initiative. So I was in, in some ways very inspired by Aggie's example to, to make that work. That's beautiful. Tanya, you and Catherine have made a lot of work together um, over the years and you've, um, you've certainly had dialogues for a long time. How has this project um, evolved for, for you two? Well, this project is, um, uh, you know, it just, it, it's a very emotional project for me to have been involved with, to have been um, uh, entrusted to uh, help Catherine make it. It was such a beautiful, organic evolution to becoming a movie. And what Glenn and Catherine were talking about with um, artists inspiring other artists with Brian Stevenson in inspiring him and with this film with Ava DuVernay's 13th inspiring Aggie to sell her art, the elections time to fund the Art for Justice Fund, the interconnectedness of all of this um, to me is very beautiful. And the interconnectedness of the films that Catherine and I have made together and the way that they kind of exist side by side is also really beautiful going back to What's on Your Plate, and then Born to Fly with Elizabeth Streb. You know, just these, these films that have a lot of heart um, and that also show how people um, with a, and who are inspired to do something to change the world can actually take action. And I think that what Aggie did, Alex Herzon, I, I cite the line that she says in the film so much, which is that Aggie really is an example of, of like a rallying cry to just throw down your glove and do something. And, um, and the way that Catherine and I came together around this film was really casual. Like let's film Aggie in conversation with the people in her life. Um, that was it. It was not to make a movie, but after every filming, I, I would say it feels like we're making a movie. And then one day it became very clear and it's just so gratifying to have it come out now at this very bizarre time, but also a very appropriate time. 
yeah. where people need to be inspired about the power of art and the connectedness of art and justice. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Catherine did mention that she, you kept insisting it was a movie and she kept insisting it was not a movie. And then it, it became a movie, of course. What, what you described to, to bro another word of Brian Stevenson's is proximity and that's relationship. So there's something, and I think Catherine, you, you brought that up as well, this idea that if somebody is um, uh, exposed to an idea, maybe it's something that spreads and that's through relationships and one-to-one -one, um, interactions, which I think is a really a beautiful part of the story that, that Aggie tells, which is friendships. And, and Glenn, something that you also point to that I think is incredibly important with this story and you can all speak to is the depth model um, of, of with which Aggie approaches artists. And so Catherine, you had a great quote about this and I wondered if you could share it. Um, wait, which one? <laughs> oh, sorry. See, I'm, I'm doing my research. Uh, I'm like a great quote about relationship. No, just about about Glenn in one of the, the conversations with Aggie talking about how she actually wanted to see the process. You no, know, it's so important that thank you because that is important. And I was still stuck on this idea of curators are going to save us. And I believe that's true yeah. and because I also believe that critics are going to save us. And there's been a lot of work done about critics and films and how, for example, Green Book, which goes to a big, huge festival and gets a few big critic, you know, reviews by mainstream white critics who say, this is the godsend film. And by the time people who are impacted by this story and have knowledge about this story are talking about it, nobody's reading those anymore. And suddenly, Green Book gets the best film. So I think that curators, critics, it does relate to your new question, but it was also, I was still hanging on. Yeah. And was talking about it, I was like, yes, because this is, it is really an ecology. It's a whole group of people. And whether that's Glenn and Aggie or me and Tanya, I mean, so what I, I, I do, I actually have, I have Glenn's quote right here because because it was, a, it was an amazing thing. And as Tanya said, we weren't making a movie. We started filming, originally it was just me interviewing Aggie. One of those was bad, that was the end. So we started recording with my children talking to her and they all four of them appear in the film. And then she was like, oh, I could do this. Like, cause I wanted to record some conversations. She's not on film. Like I think everyone should go ask each other, not just elders, but just talk more. And I actually think at this time we are spending our time making more of our moments together because people can only withstand one hour on Zoom. So talk about real things. And so then different people came in and Glenn came in and artists and different people. And we started talking to people and it was in those relationships that define who Aggie is. And really after probably 10 of them, Tanya just insisted and said, this is a movie. If you're not going to make a movie, we're going to make a series. <laughs> and I was like, no, we're not making a series. Like, let's just make one movie. But, you know, and then we ended up filming over 35 conversations. So the point you're talking about is that Aggie has always told me that she collects contemporary art because she wants to know the artist. Yeah. And Glenn said this beautiful thing. He said, if someone has a relationship with an artist, and knows the, what the artist is up to, they'll see that sometimes what the arts think is the most important work is not what the market, it, 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 is not what the market thinks is the most important work. So the artist and the market might be going in completely different directions, right? The market says, we'll get a million dollars for that thing. And Glenn is thinking, I think it's always more interesting to have that kind of relationship so you can see what the artist has learned from, even in their own work. I've kept some pieces where I thought this is not the best piece in terms of the market, what a gallerist or what a collector would want, but it's the piece I've learned the most from. Like, why would you not want to know what Glenn is learning from to make his next work? Um, and that is where Aggie's delving in. He says, it's the, it's the piece that I can see new work coming out of. And I think a good collector, they get into the artist's head like that. And Glenn, maybe you can talk, like there aren't a lot of collectors that are willing to get into your head like that. Well, I think it's just about also trusting someone that, you know, that this, you know, making art is thinking. So you have to trust someone. Uh, 
a curator, a dealer, a collector to think with you about the work. So there's a lot of stuff I never show anyone, but I will show something to Aggie because I value her opinion, the way I show things to artist friends that I would never show to a dealer or someone else, you know? So it's about trusting that someone gets that the intellectual process behind making an artwork is as interesting as the final product and that the final product may not be as good as some other final product, you know, but I'm serious about that, that oftentimes the things that I keep in the studio are the things that maybe don't quite work, but I see so many possibilities for other work in. And I think it's really special when you have someone like Aggie that wants to see those things, not to collect them, but to understand in greater depth what the work is about, you know, what the intellectual underpinnings of the work are. And, and that, I found that is actually rare. I was just gonna say, Glenn, like what you were just saying made me think like how rare Aggie is in the art world ecosystem, how like uh, it, it is very innate for her to be intentional in questioning and being curious and really trying to, um, you know, dismantle in her own way, very entrenched patriarchal and racist structures. Um, and what we were talking about earlier with the you know, critics and curators pipeline and how corrupted that has been. There's been a question posted in the chat about the Whitney Museum um, BIPOC fiasco. And I'm, uh, I'm, I, I am curious to hear us talk about that. But what I would say is that um, with regard to the film, I think what becomes especially relevant and important about it is that yes, we're exploring Aggie and her philanthropy and her um, commitment to art and justice, but we're also really exposing what more people in the art world should be doing. And that's when I go back to Alex Herzon's rallying cry, because um, until we, we take apart this system, uh, we won't be able to like remake it in a way that's going to make sense, especially after this year. I think, you know, Billy's, Billy Wright asks this question, um, which Tanya just spoke to, which I think is a really important one, how um, there's this progress in some, some sense and so, in certain areas, the studio museum are, are leading and then there are other, I think the, the museum world is a hot spot and kind of a case study for what's going on in the world um, around us. Um, you know, there is a quote, Catherine, and I'm gonna quote you from another, I was lucky enough to be on um, the CCL um, conversation around Aggie and you said um, that actually the end goal for the work that you're doing and Aggie is doing and that we all hope to see done um, would get rid of philanthropy because philanthropy is actually part of the, the very problem that it's trying to solve and so I think that this question is a really interesting one when it has when it comes down to are you modeling behaviors that people then actually follow suit or do they think it's taken care of and so they don't have to participate? I wondered if you could talk about that because I, I, I certainly do think that there's something um, very at once, it's amazing and iconic that Aggie is Aggie, but there's one Aggie, right? So how, how is it that we start to, and you, you began to talk about this a little bit through modeling, I think, and Tanya, it's what's you're getting, what you're getting to as well. How do we inspire behavior um, that then in a funny way renders itself obsolete? Um, through the system. So Catherine, do you mind? Cause I was, I thought that was a fantastic uh, way to talk about philanthropy and the way that we're moving but I wanted to hear more about it. Johanna, there's so many questions in what you just said. So first, I, I mean, it's a great question and it is actually the crux of the work that we're doing right now. Because as Glenn says in the film I think you've sh sort of shown shame to the art world. Like you've introduced this notion yeah. that People need to not only um, look at where they are, but actually give something up. And I don't mean as literal as the film. I mean, like give up space, give up leadership. And we're seeing it very specifically in the art world in a lot of your art institutions yes. right now, that, they're, that it's not just a question of adding someone to the table. It's actually stepping back and letting there be a different a whole vision for what's gonna happen. Um, 
And I think that, you know, what's interesting to me is how it, part of your question, which really tipped me off and I was like, that's a whole other part, is this very patronizing notion that Aggie's taken care of it. Right. Aggie's dealt with this one little part. And what I love in the film is when Rue says, it's so obvious, like why, why is this the first? So to answer your actual question, which was about how do we get rid of philanthropy? It's not that I want to get rid of philanthropy. No, of course. Yeah. The idea of philanthropy really is about taking care of each other. And I think COVID has introduced on a much broader scale, all kinds of notions about mutual aid and the fact that we're all philanthropists. We take care of our families. We take care of each other. We take care of our communities. We're taking care of our schools, our students, our teachers. I mean, it just, it starts right here and moves out. What, what, but what I, what you're referencing is the idea that philanthropy, the, the financial philanthropy is based on a system of inequality and extraction. And that if we are actually using philanthropy to fight for economic equality, that there will then be no need for philanthropy if we're successful because there won't be people with more than they need and there won't be people with less than they need. And that is supposedly the structure of philanthropy. And then we go and traditional philanthropy is about maintaining the structures that keep some people with museums and parks and universities. I mean, people go to these fancy universities, oh, many of us, and, and then give money to those universities, not to the places where poor kids and working class children are being educated they give to the universities where the rich kids are being educated. So as you spoke about earlier, it's like a hospital that only treats well people. You know, we don't, we don't need more of those and that's not gonna actually address the issues that we're talking about. And I think part of what Kat's um, getting at too is the very transactional nature of philanthropy mm -hmm. that is really being exploded right now. That in order for somebody to be generous, they have to get something in return which is like the whole, which the art world is, you know, very much culpable of the whole nation, nature of the, you know, the benefit auction, <laughs> you know, like, like that an artist has to donate a work for a philanthropist to buy in order for a cause to get a contribution that it so de deeply needs. I mean, this, this transactional nature of philanthropy is one that we really do have to question and explode. But that is a very hard thing for philanthropists to do because it takes, it requires them to take responsibility for their own greed. Well, one of my favorite moments, there are a lot of favorite, oh, sorry, Catherine, go ahead. I was just gonna add one tiny thing to that, which I loved, which was that, you know, several people in the, in the reviews and in comments and, in, in our community have said, you know, we need more Aggies. And yes. I would love to have more Aggies. But, but, but what I loved was when an artist who appears in the film, Teresita Fernandez, we, we did a conversation the other night and we talk a lot, we're close friends. She said, I am Aggie. And that's what I'm going for with the film. It's not this notion that we need to get the, you know, thousand or less people who have a hugely expensive painting on their wall to sell their painting. It's that I actually want everyone to realize that they are Glenn and they are Tanya and they are Johanna, that what they can do, you know, when Glenn says, I couldn't even buy my own painting. I can't, he can't buy his own paintings, Yeah, um, but he can participate by taking the signature of Brian Stevenson, you know, the Martin Luther King of our day and take this signature and make this neon and sell it to people and contribute to the Equal Justice Initiative, which is not just lawyers, defense lawyers, which is how they began, but now they have a memorial, they have a museum, the cultural change the narrative change, he made a movie, he made a book, like he's in this storytelling with us and Glenn has a role in that. And he doesn't need to have a painting by Roy Lichtenstein that's worth $165 million on his wall. Well, that makes me think like if only Brian Stevenson were the cultural, were, were all the cultural critics of America, because I really think of him as a culture critic, not just a justice warrior. Mm, that's interesting. 
I just wanted to read, just interject with one quote for, that's in the film from Darren Walker. And he says, philosophy, uh, sorry, philanthropy inspired by generosity versus philanthropy inspired by justice. And the difference in that, you know, like people can be generous in terms of philanthropy, but to, to do philanthropy inspired by justice is a different thing. You know, it has different parameters. It looks different, you know? So I think that's some, some of the things that the film is trying to get at. Well, it's, it's funny, what I was gonna say is that one of my favorite parts of the film is when, you know, obviously the story of telling that the Lichtenstein happens, which by the way, we're huge Lichtenstein fans here in Ohio, as you know, and I think some of the foundation folks are even with us tonight, um, that the reaction, I mean, Aggie says, everyone says, why would you do that? What, are we, what, what do you mean you're starting art for justice? Why are you going to the prisons? It's exactly what you're talking about, which is there's a, a reversal of the kind of expectation that she would sell the painting to buy more or buy whomever, but instead invests um, directly into the, the system that she's um, engaged with, but without distancing it from art or making those things separate. And it is a spend down um, fund, right? Which is also really an interesting, uh, to me, that's a very interesting point. It, it, and maybe you wanna talk a little bit about that, but that also um, enables discussions about how others need to step in to watch a spend down um, that I think otherwise in other places would have been handled differently. So I just, Glenn, you're, to your point, I think that's that difference between generosity mm -hmm. and justice, how there's a pointed decision, but also call for action, I think. Um, and maybe, maybe we can talk a little bit about um, where art for justice is um, in this moment. I'd love to, to hear. Uh -huh. Again, there's so many questions in your question, but um, from generosity to justice and the spend down notion is really different, is that um, Art for Justice, $100 million to yep. spent in five years. Yep. That was in a response to many things. One is that if you're actually fighting to end mass incarceration, you don't want it to go for 20 years. Right. So you're right. not creating an endowment that goes you know, in perpetuity. Right. You get the, the other part I think really is relevant to this conversation is that it's kind of a um, reparations approach. Mm -hmm. It's about saying, here's this money. It yeah. needs in the field, the people who are the artists and the activists who are doing the work and conceiving of this visioning, this abolitionist future, however we get there, that is the future we all sh would, should share if we don't. That however we get there, the people on the ground are the ones that, are, that know how to get there. The people closest to the problems are closest to the solutions. And the furthest from the resources. And Aggie's saying, let's put it out there. Let's get it out there. So Art for Justice, quickly, I will just update by saying that Aggie did start it by saying to her peers and other collectors and um, philanthropists, please join me. And 30 people and couples did join from the very beginning as founding donors. And then she would never, to Tanya's point, ask artists to give. She would never do that. Right. She would ask the collectors, the gallerists, whatever. And what she did was create this beloved community that made people want to be a part of it. And Mark Bradford, to his beautiful, soulful credit, and, and Glenn was there, came along and met a couple of the artists who are our fellows and said, I want to participate in this. I want to, the Ford Foundation has been so generous and Darren to cover all staffing and administration. So every dollar that comes into Art for Justice goes right to the field. Mm -hmm. And Mark Radford made an addition and sold 40 pieces and raised a million dollars for Art for Justice, gave every penny, his gallery, Hauser and Worth, charged no fees and the entire million dollars went to the fund. And since then, we've had a lot of artists, including actually artists who are artist fellows of Art for Justice, mm -hmm. um, Dwayne Betts and Titus Kafar, who gave a piece from their edition that we funded mm -hmm. um, and they gave that back to the community. And since then we have Julie Maritu and Jeff Coons and Mark DeSuvera. There are a lot of artists who are giving work. Um, and I say that to raise up the artists, not to say that artists are the people who for the most part should be funding Art for Justice. But I do think that it's a, this kind of amazing community that is created by someone like Aggie and the work of the community, of the beloved community of the Art for Justice, grantee fellows and grantee partners. And that those are the people, the artists and activists who are really getting the work done, including Brian Stevenson. And for that, it becomes an attractive community to be a part of, whether you're a donor, artist, activist, or all three, which I think most people are identifying as. 
We have a, a question from uh, somebody who's a good friend of the WEX, Jessica Burton. She's asking, what do you think is hindering others in similar positions as Aggies to follow her example in the blatant way that she has? Glenn, Tanya. <laughs> um, ooh, difficult. I, I think it's something you mentioned before. It, um, philanthropy can be transactional. And so the model is set up you give a work, you give money, you get a name on a wall, you know, in a museum space. That's the normal model. And it's hard to think outside of that model for lots of different reasons. Um, but also I think it's because um, it's something Aggie said, I can't remember if she said it to me or it's in the film, but you know, and you said it Kat, you know, people were saying to Aggie, you're gonna go to a prison, why? You know, don't those people, they're in jail. Didn't they do something wrong? So there's this sense of like, you're not supposed to extend yourself to certain areas, you know? <laughs> like you just give your money somewhere and then you're done, you know? And Aggie's model is, no, I wanna see what's going on in these spaces. I don't wanna just hear about, you know, uh, incarcerated people. I want to see what it is like. I want to talk to people. I want to be amongst them. And I think there's a resistance, frankly, from a lot of people who have a lot of privilege and access from recognizing that that is a huge part of what this society has created and what this society is about. Because it fundamentally means you have to think differently about your own position. Yeah, and I would add to that, um, you know, in an optimistic, uh, through an optimistic lens, there are many philanthropists who do, um, to do hold a light to Aggie's example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it's, so we should be mindful that there are many who do the right thing without being forced to. But taking uh, th through a cynical lens, there are far more who um, don't do the right thing because they don't have to, because they are uh, have entitlement, because they have impunity, and because it's um, hard for them to put themselves in other people's shoes. It's what Darren Walker talks about with regard to empathy. I think people understand the notion of sympathy, but empathy is a word that I feel is still somewhat abstract. It's, it's hard to, it's, it's, it's really actually hard to explain unless you experience it yourself. And um, I'd be curious what Glenn and Catherine think about this, but it's such a hard thing to teach. Um, hmm. And, you, you know, like I, I hear it so much on the campaign trail right now because of the erosion of empathy um, that has been persistent, not just the last few years, but over the last few centuries, the dehumanizing of people. And I think that when you have, you know, money and real estate kind of ruined the world, those two concepts. So um, mm -hmm. because of our hierarchical structures, we've facilitated this total devaluation of empathy. I think that's, go ahead, Glenn. Oh no, I was just gonna, I, as, as Tanya was speaking, I was thinking of a Basquiat piece where he says, plush, safe, he thinks. You know, the idea that, you know, that wealth gives you a certain kind of safety in the society, or you think you have a certain kind of safety that you'll never be in the position that those unfortunate people are in. But also I think, you know, what was interesting to me to hear in the film as I watched it again was Aggie saying after, George Floyd's murder, uh, she said, oh, I was having dreams where I couldn't breathe. That's empathy. Yeah, Eric Garner, yes. Or, sorry, Eric Garner, Eric Garner. Same, yeah. same. I mean, it's like yeah. it repeats yeah. over and over and over again. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it became the mantra of the movement. I mean, I think that it's, it is about economy because it's about segregation. And that goes back to what you invoked, Glenn, from proximity and, and Brian's idea of proximity that, there, that to me, one of the most moving parts of the film is when Aggie um, responds to Darren, when he says, uh, she says, do you have people who think art for justice is a bad idea? And he says, of course, some people think you go to prison, you did something wrong, you go to jail. And, and she says, 
and her, it's just such a bald, it's such a pure Aggie moment. And she just says, have they ever been to one? Because there is no way in her vast imagination that she could imagine, picture someone who knows what's going on inside the prisons and jails in this country, who would believe that it was a humane way to treat someone. And, and it's that bit of proximity where she's like, I've been there and you cannot cage a human being. When she goes in a prison, she sees an artist. She sees artists and scientists and teachers and people who could help us solve our current problems. And, you know, it's not even like, to me, the empathy, yes, that's a first step. It's, it's primary, but we have to go further than that. And that it's like this, there's something where Aggie takes it beyond empathy, which isn't just, I will walk in someone else's shoes, but I acknowledge that all people have something to contribute. I mean, I challenge any of us to actually believe that, to, 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 to think about that, to try to internalize that, that every single person that you disagree with, that you don't like, that you fear, that those people all have something to contribute and they have a place and, and, and a role in our society. And if we can actually acknowledge that, we would be completely different. Than yeah, and I know that we don't have much more time left, but there's this powerful moment in the film where that I also find one of the most vulnerable moments where Aggie talks about her own ignorance when she was growing up in Ohio and not knowing uh, the, the story of Henrietta who worked in her family home. And I'd be curious if there's anything, Kat, you'd wanna say about that because that to me is a really beautiful turning point where you realize that Aggie herself had to go through an awakening to get to where the person she is now. Yeah, I mean, I think awakening is the perfect way to talk about the current moment, that it's about epiphanies, it's about reckonings, and it's about awakenings and in various orders. And to me, the story about Henrietta always comes back to her knowing that there was something else. That's that, you know, she couldn't represent her own family because Aggie didn't know her family. She wasn't encouraged to nurture her relationship with Henrietta. Henrietta cleaned and cooked. And she knew she was somebody who had something to do with where the food was coming from. But I think there was a part of Aggie that knew that there was this other place and that there was a different life, like not everybody lived with their five siblings in the countryside with the donkey and a governess and food cooked every day for them by someone other than their mother. There was like a way that she knew she lived someplace else. Everyone else in her home, she was very sheltered and they were removed from the downtowns of the area. And I think that she knew that this woman came from someplace else. She came on the rapid transit, she came on the she came from a different town and she had a family and even if Aggie didn't know it. And so that's what I, I feel like Henrietta represents for me in terms of Aggie is, is always knowing there was another place. And she did that when she went off to that high school and she knew she was different and she felt different. She always felt like an outsider, which to me, I knew what that felt like as a young dykey tomboy. I was a boy. <laughs> I was a boy and, and I knew, you know, that everyone else treated me like a girl and, and I was a boy. And I think that Aggie somehow knew she was outside and it's that same visioning. Like, you know, there's this mainstream narrative and you're not part of it. And, and, and I think she's always not been chasing that, but been understanding this, this perspective. I did one of my favorite parts. I say, I'm saying this over and over, so I clearly have a lot of favorite parts, but was the footage of you um, taking her to the PFLAG um, rally. And I, you know, it, was, it made me really curious how, I mean, did you always have this relationship where you could sort of, she was such a groundbreaker for herself. She left her husband and came with four kids to New York because she knew she wanted to be part of the art world and she carried that with her. Was there anything about that that was difficult as a, as a child of Aggie or was it actually just, I mean, it looks wonderful. <laughs> so I'm curious. I mean, you know, divorce and, um, and, 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 and sexism are not wonderful and easy. And right. 
I think, you know, I mean, I appreciate it. I'm not. I mean, being her child seemed wonderful. I mean, there is the wonderful, I think I realized the wonderful more as I, yeah. And realized that, uh, you know, not only did most of my friends um, get criticized, disowned, dehumanized, yeah. you know, smalled, made yeah. small when they came out by their family, made small, like you, that, that they didn't matter. Yeah. And, and that was not a part of it. And I think there was a way that, that her ability to see, um, to see that humanity came early and it came before me. Yeah. And so that when I was able to say, you know, here I am, I, I mean, I really felt like I did anything I wanted to do. And at the time she was like, oh, you're a little radical. Why do you have to be militant? She kept using that word when I was younger, but you know, and I, and I just thought, well, a militant used to love me, so I'm going to go with my gut and <laughs> do that. Um, yeah. So, you know, it was that. She kept coming with me. And, and as a mother, you know, she had four kids. I have four kids. It is the number one lesson I learned from her was, was that I need to grow. I don't know all the things and that I can change. I can change my opinion. I can change how I act. I can change how I look. Like I had very short blonde hair. Um, you know, you, you can change and you can grow and you can do what you want. You know, she still does that, right, Glenn? I mean, you know, she's like, Glenn is one of Aggie's favorite people in the world. And I think she sits with him and talks to him and she learns from him and she asks him questions. Part of what I cut out of their interview and everyone's actually was her asking them questions, mm -hmm. right? right hard difficult questions yeah but she's curious as you said she wants to know she wants to change she learns from other people it's it's a great call and it's really nice to hear you cat talk about that that preceded you know you <laughs> being there because sometimes parents have to catch up with their children's aspirations and dreams but sometimes the parents are they're already there. They're already making space for this other life, you know? And it seems like Aggie was that kind of person. Like she imagined like she needed to make space for you and her other kids to grow into the people they wanted to be, which was different than who she was. So that's an extraordinary self-knowledge and gift, I think. You know? Well, and also for me, having been a fly on the wall during these conversations, it. Um, the thing that really struck me is um, mm. what I've experienced from Aggie too, which is just her uh, acceptance of everybody as they are, like just accepting people on their own terms. But the other thing that really struck me in addition to her curiosity was that she's kind of naughty. Like <laughs> she's, she's like kind of mischievous and, and, and that sense of mischief makes it, like she en enjoys mischief. She enjoys that delight. And we see that in like the conversation with John Waters mm. and um, with Jack, you know, the, the yeah. <laughs> talking yeah, about the sex, about talking that. about the sex clubs in New York and talking about, yeah, you know, LSD and sleeping with artists. Like, wouldn't it have been great? All those moments that that wicked sense of humor is also, it just makes it fun. Right. As we come to a close, I can't remember who, which of you described um, her this way, just, but it, it puts a kind of nice ending to this discussion, but also could be a model for how we think about, um, about moving forward in a productive way that she's always called people in instead of calling them out. I can't remember that. I think mm. maybe was you, Catherine. And there's something I think very profound about that at a moment like this, when there's so much um, there is a lot of calling out and there is a lot of negativity, but instead thinking about cr a critical apparatus of calling in, of, of inviting in. So that's a wonderful way, actually, even to sum up our conversation is that we're not going to get anywhere by calling people out and leaving people out. We need everyone to have the critical thinking, to have the arts education, to have the vision and the future, to have confidence in themselves. And when I came out to Aggie, she said, she said, I've known that since you were little. <laughs> like, why didn't you tell me? 
literally my answer. I was driving. I was like, why didn't you tell me? You could have saved me all this trouble. And she said, well, I was hoping for the best, but I'm just wondering about this woman you like. And she immediately started calling me in to her world. She was like, this is where I can connect with you. And even though I didn't think it was going to be good because I thought you might get hurt was really what she was saying. Not I was hoping for the best because I wanted a debutante. Although I think she would have liked one of her three daughters. <laughs> debutante ball. But she was saying, you know, like you are who you are. And I want to know more about that because you're part of my world. Mm -hmm. and, and, and she is part of my world. And when she says things and Glenn and Tanya and you, Johan, I mean, all of us who know her, all of us who know anyone, we are, we're not perfect. We're not gonna always say the right thing. We're not gonna always already know. We don't all know. If we all knew, we would not be in this debacle right now. If, you know, we don't know. So we're figuring it out together. Tanya and I have been at this work for decades now together. We don't always make the right decisions on the broader world or in even our relationship or our collaboration. But if we stick with it, and we keep working, we're gonna end up moving forward. And I have to end, and I don't mean to like shout out whatever, but Ava DuVernay, who's, who's 13th, made this piece. She took activism, made an art piece. And she made this piece, and this piece is what made Aggie start Art for Justice. And the only reason I made this film about my beloved mother was because she started Art for Justice, not all the other incredible things. I did it because she started Art for Justice. And because of that, Ava, posted about the movie on her on her Instagram and she said that it, it was this woman saw her film and ha and it had this effect you know Glenn could have, like what does it mean when a, someone sees your artwork and does something and because of that you can't imagine how many people not only have watched this trailer but have written these incredible things we need each other we need each other right now here's a lot of people following Ava Black artists, activists, activists of all kinds, people who understand defunding the police, people who are trying to, you know, pursue abolition. All of the people who are writing over a thousand people have written that that they that they love this idea that somebody is showing something you can do that will make the world better. And and so, you know, I feel like part of the reason that people are glomming on to this on Ava's, on Ava's Instagram right now is because it provides an opening for anybody, for everybody. And it says, we need everybody. We're, we're calling in everyone in this movie. And art is what takes us there. If that the art gives you an infinity, it gives you an endless place to go. And, and that's what Aggie's for seeing. There's not like one thing you need to sign up for. Sorry, go ahead, Glenn. Here, here. No, here, here, Kat. She's not free. <laughs> that's amazing. And so true. It's probably a great place to, <laughs> to wrap up, although I do feel like we could talk for much longer. Um, and so I do want to just thank you, all of you, so very, very much for spending time with us um, and for, for sharing your thoughts. And to also thank Marcus, who one more time in Strand Releasing for offering us access to the film, which is tremendous. So on behalf of the WEX, we extend our gratitude to all of you and to everyone watching. And thank you for a, a really amazing evening. Thank, thank you so you much. Joe, this was yeah. wonderful. Thank you. Love thank the you. Yeah.